Good morning. You may have recognized our long lost liturgist um, or candle lighter there. Laurel is back with us at least this week. I think she's at Camp Carew a good bit this summer. So uh, she'll be out in this wonderful heat all day, every day. Won't that be wonderful? A um, couple of announcements this morning. Um, prayer group is going to meet on Tuesday. Uh, the book study group is taking a break for the rest of the summer. Uh, the kids' Sunday school class is going to meet next week and then take a break for summer as well. Um, the adults are just going to keep on struggling through because that's what we do. We wouldn't know what to do if we didn't do something, so we're going to keep on doing that. We're at the latter part of the month, and so we have very little happening on the calendar officially. Um, the garden survived a week of our wonderful attention. Um, it is still growing. It has had some additives added to the soil so that hopefully it will grow faster and better. Um, and there are starting to be tomatoes and other fun things like that on the vines out there. So you can go out and check that out for yourself um, later. We did attempt to have a blood drive at the end of May. We're rescheduled now for August for that. So start watching things in a little while for that on your calendar. But that is not an immediate event that's going to happen. And we'll just pray that the truck doesn't break down on its way down from Effingham this time. Um, do we have other announcements this morning? Susie. Okay, so Susie has a collection box for supplies for our local migrant workers in the Narthex. If you get them in there this week, she will take them over. Otherwise, you need to haul them to the Carbondale Public Library or the co-op in Murdale by July 3rd. Dan. Okay, so Dan has assembled, Dan and Susie have assembled a memorial poster for JJ. It's near the Health Ministry Bulletin Board in the Fellowship Hall if you want to look at that. There's also coffee made, so, you know, I, I don't need to drink anything hot on a day like today, but if you can't survive without it, there is coffee yet. Yeah, Dave will finish whatever's left, I'm sure. Um, just mainline it straight into his veins. Bill? Okay, so we're hitting the high production time for leaf. Um, so if you want to order produce from them, you can conveniently pick that up here at the church on Thursday afternoons between four and five. You'll even know the man who's going to hand it to you because it's Bill. Um, typically op ordering for that opens on Friday, middle of the day and closes Tuesday evening. So you have a weekend to order ahead for leaf if you want that fresh produce. Are there other announcements this morning? Granger is our liturgist. Susan is our musician from down on Cyril Blaine. So let's worship God.
I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Good morning. Friends, will you join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin? We live in loud and noisy days. Pop-ups dance for our attention and videos shout at us. Promising our heart's desires. Infecting us with the ways of the world. We long to hear you completely and clearly. We come having cleared our calendars for this time and this place. That we might encounter the truth of God who lives and dies and lives again. Amen. Amen. Friends, our opening hymn is number 275, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. You may be seated. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Our old selves were crucified with him so that we might be slaves to sin no more. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. There is a wideness in your mercy, O oh God. And we need that wideness, as our sin is varied and wide-ranging. We are people who leave undone what we should do. And do what we should not. 
We speak when we should be silent and are silent when we should speak. We are a people who prefer war to peace and conflict to cooperation. Forgive us, we pray. And may your forgiveness restore your image in us, that we may follow you more closely, more faithfully, more fruitfully. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Therefore, friends, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks. be to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I don't think I've sung melody on that song in 10 years. <laughs> Catherine, I need you to come forward. This summer's uh, sermon series is about uh, the Bible passages the kids don't know, which they are inflicting upon us. Um, Catherine has started doing confirmation with her mom at Harrisburg. She'll be confirmed and become a member here. And part of those things and processes is that we give a Bible um, as she starts confirmation. So Catherine, um, hopefully you'll read it and you won't have quite as many obscure references for me to preach from, from here on out. Uh, but know that this congregation has long valued both scripture and the engagement of the youth. And so we give you scripture that you may continue to be engaged. Go in peace. Um, we're going to need to make sure that we do have audio on Wilson's scripture passage. So I'm going to step to the back for a moment um, because Wils is reading the first scripture passage on a recording. I'll give you a topic. Jeremiah 28, 1 through 11. In the fifth month. Jeremiah 28, 1 through 11. In the fifth month of that same year, the fourth year, early in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azur, who was from Gibeon, said to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of all the priests and all the people, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon removed from here and took to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah replied to the prophet Hananiah before the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. He said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to this place from Babylon. Nevertheless, 
listen to what I have to say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. From early times, the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as the one truly sent by the Lord only if, if his prediction comes true. Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and broke it. And he said before all the people, this is what the Lord says. In the same way, will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, off the neck of all the nations within two years. At this, the prophet Jeremiah went on his way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so... For the anthem today, you all have to participate, so you don't get to just sit there this time. Um, Laurel, you know this song very well. You want to come help me? Okay. And Cindy's going to help out too. Never volunteer until you know what he's asking. <laughs> she knows exactly what we're about to do. Because, like I said, you all, you all don't get to just sit there today because... There, there are a lot of motions that go with this song. So, so, so we're, so we're going to work on those for a second. The first verse is super easy because we have peace like a river in our soul. Point at your foot. Okay. So then we have love and you can do love either like this, which is a heart or like this, like an ocean. Okay. And then joy, jazz hands, like a fountain all in our soul. And so, so they, they, they move relatively quickly, but you can do it, I promise you. You may remain seated, I will, or you can stand, either way. So, so we're, we're gonna try singing this together. So, I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. Now some love. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. Now joy. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. Now we're going to put them all together. So I've got peace, love, and joy like a river. I've got peace, love, and joy like an ocean. I've got peace, love, and joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got peace, love, and joy like a river. I've got peace, love, and joy like an ocean. I've got peace, love, and joy like a fountain in my soul. Very nice. That brings us to the second lesson, um, which is continuing in Jeremiah. This is not part that Will selected, but I figured you needed to hear the end of this part of the story. So here we go. Sometime after the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go tell Hananiah, thus says the Lord. You have broken wooden bars only to forge iron bars in place of them. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put an iron yoke on the neck of all these nations so that they may serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and they shall indeed serve him. I have even given him the wild animals. And the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. And you made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm going to send you off the face of the earth. Within this year, you will be dead because you have spoken rebellion against the Lord. In that same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
All right, Wils is going to tell us his reason, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to hear him do that. My question for this passage is, why does Jeremiah say it's easy to prof prophesy war and disaster, but peaceful predictions aren't believed until they come true? Is it because people would rather destroy their enemies than live peacefully? So Wils is going for, you know, the simple, easy, superficial questions today. Um, one of the things we learned this spring in our study about Old Testament prophets is that we probably undervalue Jeremiah as a prophet. Um, we think of him as kind of the lesser sidekick to Isaiah, and we read Isaiah um, in Advent about the child who is coming, about the people who live in darkness, about the many names that are accorded to Christ in Handel's Messiah. All of that comes from Isaiah. The images of the suffering servant come from Isaiah. So all of that then means that we don't really study Jeremiah as much. Jeremiah is actually the most quoted prophet in the rest of scripture. His images are used the most. And to give you a sense of how significant he is, the start of the passage that Will read, you saw he took all the ugly names to pronounce. Wasn't that wonderful of him? Um, starts off in the year, the fifth year of the reign of King, insert name here of King Hezekiah, I believe it is. Um, when people talk about things later in scripture, they don't date them by the king, they date them by the year of Jeremiah's prophecy. So he displaces the king as the thing by which even time is measured. So keep that in mind as we're reading this. Jeremiah gets himself into all sorts of trouble. He's thrown out of the temple. He has his scribe Baruch write down everything he said for the last 40 years and take it to the king. And the king sits there and they read it and just cut it up and throw it into the fire. And then Baruch, poor guy, poor guy, gets sent back to Jeremiah to rewrite it all again. Clearly, he should have saved it in the cloud somewhere. Um, but this passage gives us a sense of who Jeremiah is in the grand scheme of things. None of you, I'm betting, have heard of the prophet Hananiah before. Hananiah doesn't get his own book in the Bible, and there's a reason for that. Um, but Hananiah is prophesying as well while the people are in Babylon. So what has happened is that Assyria, Babylon, um, Babylon has come in under Nebuchadnezzar, and their model of war is that they take all the important people away to Babylon. So they take the politicians and the chief priests and the business owners and haul them off. So Jeremiah is prophesying to a split community. Part of the community is still in Jerusalem, and part of the community is in Babylon. And today, Hananiah is with the people in Babylon, and Jeremiah is with the people in Babylon. And Hananiah says exactly what the people want to hear. He says, it's okay, because God has told me that God is going to break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar and send everybody back. It's going to happen in the next two years, and you're all going to go back. Everybody who's in Babylon is going to go home, and even the king, Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, um, is going to go home, and everything's going to be just the way it was before. And in case you think prophecy isn't relevant, just remember that we were promised by a year ago Easter, everything would be back to normal because it's what we wanted to hear. So prophecy is still a very relevant piece of things. Jeremiah comes back at Hananiah and he says, amen, wouldn't that be awesome? Unfortunately, it's not true. And this is where Will gets his question from, is this little passage, because Jeremiah comes back at Hananiah and says, well, we've always prophesied about war and famine and disaster and chaos and drought and pestilence and plague. That's easy. The real prophets 
are the ones who prophesy peace. And you know they're real prophets because it comes true. And that's where Wills is stuck. Um, that's where his curiosity arises is, why do we like the prophets who do war and death and destruction? And, and you saw that a little bit of cynicism has creeped into Wills already that, uh, is it because it's really just easier than getting along with people? Out of the mouths of babes. So, yes, Wills, that's part of it. Um, that's very much part of it. What I want us to think about, though, is how challenging peace is in general compared to war and conflict and pestilence, to drought. We go all the way back to Joseph prophesying drought and famine. Um, and that prophesied also seasons of abundance. Remember, thin cows, fat cows. We go through Elijah and Elisha making abundance out of nothing, making life out of death. We go through lots of prophets who prophesy against all the nations around Israel and then point the finger back at Israel and say, and if it's that bad for the unfaithful people, imagine what it's going to be like for you people who know better. I think, honestly, some of it is because we can see the results of war and famine and pestilence so much faster. What are the fruits of peace? How fast do they show up? Our modern American history is that up until roughly 1918, we were a debtor nation. We were in debt to everybody. I know it's hard to believe, given that we only have like a $12 trillion national debt now, um, that in 1919, we were the world's foremost creditor nation. How did that happen in a span of five years? Well, we weren't at war, but everybody else was. And we sold them everything they needed. What were the fruits of the First World War? As far as America was concerned, it was a booming economy. It was a change in status. It was a move to the top of the front page. What were the results in Germany? By 1930, it took a grocery cart full of Reichmarks to buy a loaf of bread. Unparalleled inflation. Unparalleled hopelessness. Was that really peace? I mean, it was just that we weren't at war, but was that really peace? I think I'd have to argue it wasn't really peace, the way God would describe peace. And so for us, the question is, what are the fruits of war and conflict? On a small scale, really small scale, we lose friends. We lose relationships. We lose opportunities. We often lose hope. We lose joy. We become bitter. I know none of you would ever have any of that happen because you get along so well with everybody. But I've also seen you without your coffee in the morning, so I know that's not entirely true. We know that when we get into conflict with somebody, often when we realize we don't even have to be at fault. Often when we realize we're in deep conflict with somebody, we have trouble sleeping. We have trouble eating. We have trouble finding rest. For lack of a better word, we have trouble being at peace. What does that cost us? And how then do we live at peace? Not even on the macro, national, global scale, but just us, one with another and with our neighbors. And do we notice that we are sleeping through the night 
that food tastes again, and that we can find joy in the simplest things like daylilies blooming outside the church door? Or do we only notice the bad stuff? that our stomach is churning, that we get anxious every time the phone rings and we check the caller ID on our cell phone to see if it's that person. And that we don't go places because we're afraid we're gonna bump into them. Do we notice when we're back at peace and we don't feel anxious? I don't think we're very good at that because I think, frankly, we're so used to being tense and stressed out all the time that it almost feels wrong to not be stressed out. And that is where Jeremiah is really pointing the people of God then and now, is that when God does what God is doing in the world, it will feel fundamentally different, and you will have to notice it. It won't just be another war, another conflict, another struggle. We talked in Sunday school that in the 11 years I've been here, as we focus on Malawi, Malawi has had a drought. It has had a famine. It has had catastrophic flooding. It has had armed conflict along Lake Malawi. And it's had COVID. Wouldn't you like to see something different? What about a year of abundant crops? What about a year of not burying children? What about a year when everything goes right? Instead of it feels like everything goes wrong. That's what Jeremiah is asking Hananiah to imagine is not just that we go reset and everything's back the way it was, but that everything is not back the way it was. Everything is the way God intends it to be, which is not the way we would do it. So the passage goes on, um, and there's a lot in the rest of it. We won't cover all of it. What's important for getting at Wills' question is, yes, we struggle with peace. How many of you have a hard time when you have a day with nothing to do? There's at least a couple of you, and there's at least a couple honest ones of you who raised your hands. Um, what does peace mean? You know, if it's absent from conflict, stress, struggle, strife, anxiousness. What happens next is that Hananiah takes this wooden yoke off of Jeremiah's shoulders, which is a symbol that the people are in bondage. And he snaps it. And Jeremiah essentially just leaves the building. He's had somebody yank his necktie off of him and burn it in front of him, and he just leaves. Sometime later, that's how verse 12 starts, is sometime later, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. Um, the word of the Lord coming to someone is a very famous Old Testament phrase. I learned it from my Old Testament professor in college who is Jamaican. So I learned how to say this in Hebrew with a Jamaican accent, Ko Amar Adonai, thus saith the Lord, which means pay attention, something important is coming. And uh, Jeremiah's message is not nice. It says, hey, Hananiah, you're lying to the people. Hey, Hananiah, you're not really a prophet. You're not really faithful. You don't have truth. And none of what you have said is going to come true. On the other hand, I have a prophecy for you, Hananiah, and I am the real deal. This yoke of wood is going to be replaced with a yoke of iron. God is using Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar to discipline Israel and the world. All these things have been given into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. Oh, and by the way, you don't have two years. You're going to be dead before the year is out. 
Verse 17 closes with, and in the seventh month of that year, Hananiah died, which of course is the proof of who a true prophet is. If we kept going on into chapter 29, we would hear what God intends for the people in Babylon. And you know this passage. We've actually preached this in the last year. Essentially, bloom where you're planted. People of Israel and Babylon, look to the welfare of the city in which you find yourselves. Marry and give in marriage. Have children and raise them. Plant gardens and eat from them. And look to the peace and the welfare and the prosperity of the city. And in not two years, 70 years, God will bring you home. I don't want to wait 70 years. I mean, can't you hear the people of God? I liked the other prophet. So what that he was wrong and he's dead now? Two years sounds a lot better than 70 years. And that will is part of the challenge as well, is that sometimes we are willing to believe the lie that tastes sweet. We're willing to believe the lie that lines up with what we already think. And that makes it easier to be in conflict with one another. Because if it's just about what I want, I mean, if it's just about what Suzanne wants, if it's just about what Kay wants, then, you know, we're going to all be unhappy together. Jeremiah reminds them and us that peace is the harder road. Not because we're really destined for conflict and beating each other and hitting each other in the face and all those sorts of things, but because we don't wait well. We don't wait to see what happens for the fruits of peace to be borne out. We want it, and we want it now, or five minutes ago, either way. Um, part of the challenge for us that we experience in the seasons of Lent and Advent is to wait. Is to wait. Jesus speaks to his disciples when he's getting ready to leave in the gospel of John. And he says something that I don't know the disciples then or now grasp. He says, my peace, I leave with you. I give not as the world gives. Go in peace and do not be afraid. But that means we got to be in it for the long haul. The fruits of peace are a garden. The fruits of peace are a tree planted beside the living waters. The fruits of peace. You can't order them like a meal at McDonald's and expect to get it five minutes later. It just doesn't work. So Jeremiah's promise is both a wait and it's a, it's coming. And sometimes we only appreciate it because we've gone through the hard stuff. And sometimes we've gotten so focused on the hard stuff that we don't appreciate the peace when it shows up. Jeremiah's people, the people that Jeremiah is prophesying to, his prophecy is lived out in his body. He is stoned. He is beaten because he's not giving them the words they want to hear. But in this way, he is truly the prophet of the living God. He never leaves his people. And in that way, Jeremiah anticipates the one that we call Emmanuel, 
God with us, who we also call the Prince of Peace. Wait for it, work for it, and remember that the hardest work we do is sometimes just letting God be God. To God alone be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. Friends, our affirmation of faith today um, comes again from the study catechism. And it's about forgiveness, which might be appropriate to the conversation about war and peace. You guys get the bold type. Does your forgiveness of those who have harmed you depend on their repentance? No, I am to forgive as I have been forgiven. The gospel is the astonishing good news that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just as God's forgiveness of me is unconditional, and so precedes my confession of sin and repentance. So my forgiveness of those who have harmed me does not depend on their confessing and repenting of their sins. However, when I forgive the person who has done me harm, giving up any resentment or desire to retaliate, I do not condone the harm that was done or excuse the evil of the sin. Amen. Friends, we respond to God's word heard and proclaimed by giving of our tithes and offerings, our time and talents, and preparing to bring our prayers before God. Friends, the offering plate is up here by Granger. Um, during the offertory, you are invited to bring your gifts forward, or you can bring them forward after the service. Friends, let us give and receive our morning offering. seated. Friends, as we bring our gifts before God, we bring our joys, our hopes, our burdens, our wonder, our awe. We bring the yoke that feels on our shoulders, whether it's wood or iron, and we come to the one who says, come to me, my yoke is light and my burden easy. What else do we need to be in prayer about today? Susie? Continued prayers for Kelly, for Kelly and John. Kelly needs continued prayers to lift her up, and John needs prayers for strength. Granger? I will, uh, I will not be well met next Sunday because of the um, our resident neighbor is in Cartersville. Uh, I will be monitoring the church next Sunday, and so uh, here in the back of the Granger will be with the Carterville Church next weekend, um, moderating and prayers for that work and for the relationship going forward. Dan.
<laughs> so Dan and Roger are going trout fishing next week in Missouri. And Dan had several prayers about catching fish, not falling, not slipping, and not having his waders fill up with water. And I think one about not having Roger outwork him and um, making himself feel like a much older man was slid in there as well. So what else do we have to keep in prayer today? Suzanne. So Suzanne has several Thanksgivings this morning um, for Kathy's mom, who is with us, for Jack and Kay's wedding anniversary, and that we're seeing Lynn and Bill back with us again. And that's all celebrations and things to give thanks for. Lynn. Okay. So a, Lynn has had a month of medical diagnostics and she sort of sort of knows things now. Um, and she appreciates knowing things and hopefully knowing things will lead to good changes. Madeline. Judith. Thanks for safe travels for Charles and Kieran and Lauren and continued prayers for their daughter Ella, who's now making her way through on her own in adult world. And uh, she's got a lot of support, but she's still on her own. Certainly, certainly. Are there others? Okay. Kay asks for prayers for her daughter-in-law, Kelly, um, whose grandmother passed away in Kentucky this past week. So prayers for that family. Are there others? A reminder that as much as we have been complaining about the heat, most of us have the ability to escape into air conditioning. We had planned on setting up the small TV so I could see the crowd today, but the air conditioner for the sanctuary at Harrisburg First Presbyterian Church exploded on Friday. So they are meeting in their chapel, which does have air conditioning, but that air conditioner was original to the building in 1954 and rebuilt in 1980. Um, so Lori has the screen so she can do the technology there. Um, but thanks be to God for air conditioning. And we remember all of our friends and neighbors who struggle with the heat. Um, on another note, it was really fun to drive into the church this morning and I did my Sunday morning ritual, which is to walk out to the blessing box and take a picture so I can put the, the video together at the end of the month. And it is chock full. And none of us are really quite sure where it came from, which is kind of how we like it. Um, so we give thanks to God for this mission and ministry and the ways in which we're supporting it and the ways in which more than us are supporting it. Are there others? Ah, yeah, maybe. that's the other thing. Somebody hit the portico again this week. So um, be in prayer about that repair and everything that goes with it, because it feels like this is, this is at least the second time it's happened while I've been here. And I think it's the fourth time overall. So. Um, I don't know if God really wants us to have a portico at this point. Anything else? Will you pray with me? Dear God, we come to you this day as people who know that we get revved up sometimes for conflict and we struggle to wait to see what peace will bring. We are also a people who plant trees we plant gardens, we raise children. And so we know what it is to wait for the promise to be fulfilled, for things to be made visible. 
we come to you this day with the joys of having seen some of those fruits of peace, of waiting, for seeing friends and people we have not seen in a while, for the joys of being able to travel and see family, for the celebrations of ages and stages, for graduations and weddings, for the camp season. We pray, O oh God, and give you thanks. We pray in thanksgiving for a God who wipes the tears from our eyes as we pray for families that grieve and mourn. We give thanks for the one we call the great physician as our health is looked after by earthly physicians and those who care for us. We give thanks for the inventiveness of air conditioning on hot days. And we ask that you continue to remind us about our neighbors who have no way to get away from the heat. We give you thanks that the blessing box has become like the loaves and fishes and is filled to abundance on this day. For your people are hungry, O oh God. We come to you this day. both with a hunger and a desire to see you at work and with the faith that lives beyond a year. It gives us the patience to look for all the ways you are at work in us and around us and through us. We pray with the people who waited for the Messiah and we pray using the words that Messiah taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 753, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
Friends, as you go out this week, be reminded of the truth that every prophet who's out there is not a prophet of the one true and living God, and that every prophecy will not come true. Be patient. Listen for the one who prophesies the harder way, the way of peace. Go and be attentive for the ways in which Christ's peace is breaking into the world, in our gardens, in our homes, in our communities, in our schools, in our families. And go strengthen God's peace as it breaks out throughout God's creation. Friends, go and may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Okay, friends, we're going to try this one again. Remember, you have five shots at this thing. Persuaded to believe that you can separate it from the wonderful love of God. For above us, He will send us if we let Him live within us while in the sinful world we trot. Neither height nor depth nor principality, things present or things to come. And though the devil hate us, he can never separate us from the wonderful love of God. From the wonderful love of God For above us he will send us If we let him live within us While in the sinful world we trust Neither height nor depth Nor principality Things present or things to come And though the devil hate us He can never separate us From the wonderful love of God A little quicker For I've persuaded to believe that you can't separate us from the wonderful love of God. For above us, He will send us if we let Him live within us while in the sinful world we trust. Neither height nor depth nor principalities, things present or things to come. And though the devil hated, He can never separate us from the wonderful love of God. Two more, you can do this. For I've persuaded you. That you can separate us from the wonderful love of God. For above us, He will send us if we let Him live within us while in the simple world we trust. Neither height nor depth nor principality, things present or things to come. And though the devil hate us, He can never separate us from the wonderful love of God. Last time, a little quicker. For I'm persuaded to believe that we can separate us from the wonderful love of God. For above us, He will send us if we let Him live within us while in the sinful world we trust. Neither height nor depth nor principalities, things present or things to come. And though the devil hate us, He can never separate us from the wonderful love of God. Yay! Good job, Kathy.